Hello everyone and welcome back to the next section of Boy 87, a wonderful book. In our last chapter, things were looking a little bit more positive for Schiff, so let's hope that that pattern continues and we can see him on the rise. As always, feel free to pause the video, take notes, do as you choose. This is your opportunity to be a bit more independent with your learning. And today, in our writing activity, we are looking again at cohesive devices. A little bit more evaluating and identifying today, um, and a little bit less on the writing side. But still, it is a crucial key that we must look at, so make sure you are really, really focusing and paying attention. Right, so with no further ado, let's start with the next chapter. This chapter is 24, it is called Friend. If you want to follow along in your book, open your book to that chapter now. Okay, so, friend, <clears throat> let's get started. Wake up. Someone is gently shaking my shoulder. I blink and sit up. Where am I? Then I recognise the lady kneeling next to me. Shoo it. Pale light creeps under the door and round the shutter. We're going to the market, she nods towards the girl. I rub my fist in my eyes. I'll come to help you carry things. No, it would be better if you, if you to stay here. Rest your ankle. I notice that the room will be empty except for me and the woman in the corner whose leg and arm are bandaged. She is sitting up but her eyes are closed. Okay, thank you, I say, but I would prefer to be useful. Once they have left, I go round the room folding blankets and tidying the small space. In the corner is the pile of clothes, including some white Nutella, the type that the women and girls wear, round their shoulders and heads back at home. I wonder why they don't wear them here. I lay new wood on the fire and then go to go back inside to wait for people to return. I hear the distant sound of a donkey braying. Otherwise, the room is quiet. Soon, there is a soft knock on the door, and Shewitt and her daughter walk in with several bags. It's our job to cook for those who are working, or cannot cook for themselves. My husband, and Gannetta and her husband, she says, removing her brightly coloured headscarf. You can help us to prepare the food. She points to the small courtyard and gives me a bowl of lentils so that I can pick out the stones, then goes inside. I have watched my mother and Lemlem -Lem do it many times, but have never done it myself. The girl sits on the floor next to me with a pile of onions. We work silently. After a few minutes, the girl puts down her onion and looks at me. My name is Almaz, she says. Hello, Almaz, I reply quietly. I don't know what else to say, even though my head is almost bursting with questions. Why aren't you wearing your Nutella? I ask, realising immediately that I sound rude. She doesn't seem annoyed, because it's not safe. Why? I ask. It's best not to attract attention. There are people looking for anyone from our country, and white Nutellas are pretty easy to pick out in a crowd. I thought your mother said those people were, not, were mostly near the camps. Not only near the camps, they are just more of, more of them near the camps. How long have you been here? Almaz pushes back her headscarf. Beneath it is hair and it, beneath it her hair is braided in neat rows. Three months and four days, she answers without hesitation, staring straight at me. That's such a long time, I say alarmed. Do you want to stay here? Almaz laughs. No, we don't want to stay. We want to travel to England, but my mother and father didn't get a, didn't have enough money to pay for the whole journey, so Dad is working, collecting and sorting rubbish. Back home, he worked in a bank. Okay, you pause the video here and you read this section. Welcome back. I shall read that last little bit and we'll move on together. Speak to my father when he comes home. She has a way of making me feel that I don't need to hide things, like she won't judge me. I wonder if this is what it would be like to have an older sister. I immediately think of Lemlem -Lem and feel guilty. I hope she hasn't been missing me as much as I miss her. Her little smiles, her little games, the way she always runs straight towards me for a hug after school. At dusk, Almaz's father returns, and then Gannett's husband. After Almaz's father has drunk some tea, I ask if I can speak with him. He beckons me over with an impatient wave of his hand. I'm Mesfin. How's your ankle healing? It's a bit better. Maybe soon I'll be able to work a little. You could, he says, although it's better if people don't notice you're here at all. So you have no money? I have no money to buy food. My family can send money for travelling, though. He nods. My wife has a kind heart. You're lucky she found you first. I'm very grateful, I say. It's kind of you to let me stay here when you have a little space to share. But I want to travel to Europe as soon as I can. 
Can you help me find someone who can take me north? I can find you a smuggler. The trick is to find a smuggler who isn't going to cheat you, sell you, or kill you. Mastin looks at me as if he is waiting for me to agree. I've made contact with someone who says he can arrange for us to go. He gestures around the room. It's safer to travel together. Who has the money for you? My mother. Have you spoken to her since you left? No. How do you know the military hasn't put her in prison? I don't. I realise that I sound stupid. I have no phone, Mastin replies. He is quiet for a minute. I'm going to see my contact tomorrow evening. I'll introduce you to him. He'll give you his phone to call for the money. We'll be leaving in two weeks, by truck. If you can afford it, I recommend you do the same. The chances of you arriving in one piece, or arriving at all, are much better if you don't have to walk across the desert. The truck will take you across the border to the port, then you'll have to wait for a boat. I nod. Thank you. If you get caught, if, sorry, if you can't get the money, you'll be on your own. We can't wait for you. What can I do in return? Okay, pause the video and you read this little section. Welcome back. I shall read that last sentence and we'll move on together. Once we get settled somewhere, she'll send money to my cousin to try to bribe some officials and find out where my brother is and whether they can get him out. How about you? A little sister, Lem Lem. I would love a little sister, she says. I hope you can meet her one day, I reply. That night, as I curl up on the floor, I think about speaking to my mother tomorrow. I will be able to tell her that someone may have seen Dad alive, and that he was okay, which means there's a chance he's still alive now. It makes me think about Jonas and the other men in the container. When will I have a chance to call their families? I doubt Mastin's contact will let me uh, work my way through a list of phone numbers. Maybe my first chance will be when I get to England. I go over the information I know about each of them until I start to feel tired. Tonight, there is no black hole waiting for me. Just sleep. And that is the end of chapter 24. Okay, a couple of questions for you. What does Schiff miss about Lemlen? So, Almaz says, I wish I had a little sister, which instantly makes Schiff think about Lemlen. And what are all the things that he lists that he says that he misses about her? And then at the end, just that last little sentence there, Schiff says, Tonight there is no black hole waiting for me. Just sleep. What does he mean by this? Okay, what does he mean? No black hole, just sleep. Okay, so pause the video, have a go answering those questions, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. Okay, moving on, welcome back, and thank you for having a go at those activities. So we're going to move on to a chapter called Wait now, and I'm sure you can understand what that means. Um, chapter 25, but here's some information that you need to have a look at. So we've got shrapnel. That is what shrapnel looks like. I'm not going to tell you what it is, because it's going to be one of your questions for your next activity. A landmine, you can guess what that means. A mine is something that blows up, and a landmine is something that's dug into the ground. Scrambled egg sandwich. Ooh, that does look tasty. Uh, Gebetta board. Okay, so that's a, a game that people play, a Gebetta board. A gate, we know what a gate looks like, but this is what it's, the example we're talking about in the book. And a compound. A compound is a house surrounded by walls, so you can't get into it and you have to go through the gate to get in to be allowed. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, and cobblestones. We have cobblestones as well. We will, you may have come across those in England. We have quite a lot of them. Chapter 25, Wait. The next day, I watch impatiently as everyone leaves for work or to shop for food. Almaz's father told me that my ankle must be completely better before I can risk the journey north, so I have to take it easy. I look around for something useful to do. Folding the blankets and clothes takes me five minutes. The woman in the corner of the room, Gannett, opens her eyes and looks at me. You're busy. Why not rest while you have the chance? I can't just sit still and wait, I say. Then I realise that it sounds as if I think she is lazy. What did you do to your arm and leg? A landmine exploded when we were crossing the border, she says. Two people were crossing with the, uh, the two people we were crossing with were killed. I was hit with some pieces of shrapnel. We managed to get the pieces out, but the cuts were deep and I wasn't able to clean them properly, so they became infected. Now we're here, I'm able to bathe them and dress them. But they aren't healed yet. I feel shocked at what happened to Gannett, but, but she seems very calm. Did you know the people who were killed? I ask. We had met the day before. 
The smugglers put some of us together in a truck which took us closer to the border. So they weren't my friends, but we had planned to travel together once we had crossed the border. It was a woman and her husband. They were both young, but at least they didn't have any kids. How long have you been here? I ask. I met Stuart two weeks ago. She found us in the market, just like she found you. What about your foot? I twisted my ankle running from some guards, but it's nearly better. You're lucky. I told my husband he must leave with Stuart and her family, even if I can't go. But I know he won't leave me. Although talking to strangers is becoming easier, there's a little piece of me which cannot shake the feeling that I'm putting myself in danger every time I share my plans for the future. A little while later, Almaz and Stuart return. Money is so tight that they cannot afford large amounts of anything. Instead, they shop every day for whatever is about to run out. Okay, pause the video here and you read this next little bit. Okay, welcome back. I'll continue from that last sentence. After lunch, we nestle the half eggshells in rows in the tissue box, then take out some chickpeas and play, play our first game of Gibetta together. As dinner time approaches, we are still playing. We stow our board on the f folded cloths in the corner of the room and start chopping. It feels so good to be busy. When Almaz's father returns in the evening, he eats in silence, then wipes his hands and beckons me over. We'll go to meet Atto Madani tomorrow. Uh, Madani now. He's the man arranging our transport to Europe. My heart flutters, and I calm myself by running through the phone numbers which my mother taught me. It occurs to me that Mesfin is nervous too. We step through the door into the cool dusk air, and for a second, I allow myself to enjoy the feeling that I can walk out whenever I please, even though I know it's not safe. We walk along several twisting alleyways, then cross a wide, busy road. On the other side of the town, there are some large compounds sheltering big houses within. We knock on the door to the one of these compounds. A man opens a grill to look at us, then unlocks the gate, and we pass through into a large walled space. There is a big tree in the corner, heavy with grapefruit. There are pots and flowers scattered all around. In another corner is a table with two men drinking tea. We walk over. Mesfin greets them in their, in their language and then pushes me forward. One of the men wears a white shirt. He has a grey he has grey hair and a short beard and smells of aftershave. He greets me in my language. I can see that he is assessing me. I can tell he has done it many times before. He points to two empty chairs at the table, then sits back down. His friend wanders into the house. I'm Madani, he says. Uh, so it says the man in a white shirt. So, you want to travel north? Yes, as far as the coast and then get a boat to Europe, to England. He smiles a quick smile. You have money? My mother has saved money. Do you want to go on foot or by truck? I want to go by truck. Okay, call her and tell her that you need $5,000, then give her the number she needs to transfer the money. He leans to one side and reaches, and s reaches his hand into his trouser pocket, pulling out a large, flat phone. He types something in. There's the country code. Now enter your mother's number. My finger wavers slightly over the keys as I type. I cannot imagine how my mother can possibly have saved this much money. After a pause, the phone rings. I'm about to hear my mother's voice again, the voice I've longed to hear for three weeks. But a man answers. Who is this? he asks abruptly. I don't recognise his voice. I look up at Madani in confusion. He takes the phone and cancels the call. I'm sorry for you, he says. It sounds like the military has your mother's phone. It would be better for her if you never call her number again. Now I don't, now I don't know when I will hear my mum's voice again. Perhaps I will have to wait until I get to England. There I will be able to call my uncle to find out what is, hap what is happening. He will be able to tell me whether I can speak to mum without putting her in danger. It feels like a very long time to wait. Do you have another number you can call? Madani looks impatient. I sift through all the names and numbers stored, stored in my head, trying to stay calm and to not think about the military grabbing my mother's from her hand. I sense that this man will only give me one more chance. I choose Uncle Batha. Yes, I have another number. Badani types in the country code and hands me back the phone. The phone rings four times, then a man answers. I do not recognise his voice either, but I haven't seen my uncle for a couple of years. It's Schiff, I say. There is silent. Then the mas man asks, What do you need? 
I called mum and she wasn't there. I need some money. There is another pause. Your mother isn't at home. Lem Lem is okay. How much do you need? Five thousand dollars, I say. There is another pause. And what about Binny? Binny didn't make it across the border. Will he meet you later? Binny is... My throat seems to seize up. I don't think Binny will be able to meet me later. Call me back in one hour. He hangs up. Madani is looking at me with renewed interest. You came with a friend? Yes, he was hurt near the border. So you're on your own? Okay, you pause the video here and read these two pages to yourself. Okay, welcome back. I'll read that last sentence and we'll move on together. That's enough. It's not cheap to make international calls. When the money arrives in my account, then we can discuss dates. He nods and then he and his friend go inside, leaving me and Mesfin to let ourselves out of the gate and back onto the street, into the cold night air. When we get back, Stuart and Almaz are laying blankets down to prepare the food for the room for sleep. Almaz comes over immediately, still clutching a folded blanket. Did you get the money? Are you coming with us? My uncle has the money. If he manages to transfer it, then I'll be coming with you. A smile spreads across Almaz's face. I try to smile back. What's the matter? she asks. This is what you've been waiting for. I tried to call my mother, but she didn't answer. A man did. Someone I don't know. Almaz's smile fades. Stuart has been listening. It was probably someone from the military. It's unlikely. Oh, sorry. It's probably someone from the military. It's unlikely they'll do anything but watch your mother and sister, she says. Your mother has been through this before, hasn't she? She knows what to do. My uncle said she wasn't at home. Maybe she's with your uncle. It's good for your mother and sister to be near family right now. What shoe it makes sense. I like the idea of my mother and Lem Lem staying with my uncle. I hope Saba isn't alone either. I'm sure my mother wouldn't leave her on her own. Before Shuit finishes, Almaz disappears inside. She returns a second later, clutching the tissue box. Shif, I need your help, she says. What? I ask, happy to think about something else. I need you to eat eggs for lunch tomorrow, says Almaz. I look at her confused. She holds up the Jabetta box. Half of the eggshells have broken. I dropped it, she confesses, when I was tidying up. She looks so concerned that I find myself smiling. Okay, eggs tomorrow. Perhaps we should buy extra, just in case someone drops a few. She pulls her face at me. And that's the end of chapter 25. Looking positive again, but a bit of a scary situation for Shift to be in. Can't have to say that I'd like to be in that situation very much. Okay, so your questions for that chapter. Again, we've got a vocabulary hunting activity. Find out what these two things are and write a description of them. We've got a landmine and shrapnel. Find out what they are and write me a description. Okay, your questions. Number one, what do they use to make the game? They make a Gibretta game. What do they use? Question two, what has Binny's mother agreed to do and why do you think she's agreed? And number three, what is your opinion about this? How does it make you feel? What does it make you think? That kind of stuff. Okay, pause the video here, have a go at those activities, and then when we're back, we'll move on to the writing activity. Okay, welcome back. Today we are having a go at our cohesion again, but a bit more of a focus on identifying a cohesion as opposed to using cohesion. So, in your pack you will have an extract. It's an extract of a recount, which means it's somebody retelling something that's happened. Um, and I want you to work with a partner or on your own, depending on where you are and how you're accessing the learning, uh, and look at the text and evaluate it. Does the, do the ideas flow? Does the recount flow well? Have any cohesive devices been used? How could you improve the text? And then your last activity, edit the text to improve the cohesion. Make it easier for the reader to read and enjoy it. Okay. So here is the extract. I'll read it through for you quickly and you'll probably be able to hear from the way I'm reading where it does sound good and where it doesn't. <clears throat> I went on the most amazing, amazing holiday to Spain. My family had never been to Spain before and my dad wanted to go there because my dad because my dad was fed up of sitting around in the damp and gloom. The villa, it was baking hot. My dad took a shower. My dad needed to cool off after such a long journey. There was a swimming pool. We spent a lot of time mucking about in the water. We spent a lot of time splashing water over dad. We went to visit caves in the hills. The caves were the most amazing... Were, the caves 
were the most amazing stalagmites and stalactites. The stalagmites and stalactites were knobbly and looked like massive, misshapen spears. The stalagmites and stalactites were like bars in a zoo. The guide tapped a stal the stalagmite and the stalactites, and it was like playing a, a, a glockenspiel. The caves were quite cool, and by the end of the tour, we had all ready. We were all ready for a bit of sun and an ice cream. We visited a beach. The waves were just right for surfing. We hired some bodyboards. Dad was worried that we would drown. Dad spent the afternoon standing in the sea watching us. It was a breeze. The waves were strong enough to float, us, float in on. The waves were not too powerful. Dad was so useless at cooking, we had to go into the town every night to eat. There you could buy chips and calamari at a stall. The calamari were squid... Was, sorry. The calamari was squid cooked in batter. It tasted like rubbery fish. We played on the pinball machines. Mum wanted to see all the photos. I had a magnificent picture of Dad's very red face from too much sun. It was a great holiday and I can't wait to go back. So you can probably hear just from how I struggled to read sections of that, um, that it's not it's, the cohesion within the text is not that great. Some sections don't follow on from each other. Some sections have sentences at the end which shouldn't be there. For example, in the one, two, three, four, in the fifth paragraph, Dad was useless at cooking, and then there's, the rest of the paragraph is about what they cooked, and then at the end, we played on the pinball machines. The, those two items don't relate, they're not relevant to each other, but you could link it on by saying, after tea, we moved into the game room where we got to play on the pinball machines. It was lots of fun. Something along those lines. Okay, so that's your activity for today. And... Once you've completed that, please have a really good think about your activity tomorrow because we are doing another diary entry. It will be your last one. Um, but I want you to really think carefully about which cohesive devices you are going to include in your diary entry. Okay, How can you make sure that your writing is cohesive? So planning for cohesion, note down in your textbook or your notepad or wherever you are taking notes any examples of cohesion that you are going to use in your diary entry tomorrow. And that is your last activity for today's lesson. I hope you're still enjoying the book. It keeps on getting more and more interesting as things go along. There's some, a few interesting bits that come up, some negative, some positive, um, that we'll have to learn about as we continue over the next couple of days. Thank you for listening and I hope you are all great. Bye-bye.